Maybe you have some friends or family you know who are into this whole Torah observant movement where Christians, followers of Jesus, are starting to talk about things like eating kosher or biblically clean or, or keeping the Torah feasts or not celebrating Christmas and Easter or observing a seventh day Sabbath rest. For people who are drawn into this theology, which is broadly known as Torahism, I honestly believe that most of the time it starts with good intentions. I think they're interested in developing a deeper faith and learning more about the biblical roots of following Jesus and wanting to know God better and to please Him. What they don't realize is what a slippery slope this can be for some people. As Dr. Michael Brown has mentioned, there's sort of four stages that believers go through when they start walking down this path of Torahism. This theology will fascinate, stimulate, complicate, and then finally suffocate. And there's actually a fifth one I would add, which I'll mention in a minute. So I've seen this process many times up close and personal. You know, first we're fascinated with all this new information and insight into the ancient Hebrew and, and biblical roots of the Christian faith. And then that stimulates us to dig deeper and to study further, right? So far, so good. But before we know it, things start getting complicated. We begin to dig into the laws that Yahweh gave to the ancient nation of Israel and try to work out what that means for followers of Jesus today, according to the gospel in the New Testament. I mean, the Torah says animal sacrifices are required, but the New Testament says that Jesus was our sacrifice once for all. So what do we do with that? And should we commemorate the birth of Jesus or his resurrection? If so, how? And how do we respond when a non-kosher Christian friend invites us over for dinner? So, ultimately, these Hebrew roots beliefs begin to suffocate us. The focus of our faith walk, faith walk begins to narrow down to what we're going to eat or not eat and, and what we can and can't do on a Sabbath day's rest, rather than focusing on sharing the gospel and being the hands and feet of Jesus. And here's where I would add a fifth stage to that process legislate. At some point along the way, many followers of Jesus who consider themselves to be Torah observant begin trying to enforce their beliefs on other Christians. And that's where the line is crossed, in my opinion. If you want to keep the, the seventh day Sabbath or maintain a kosher diet, go for it. You, you are well within your freedom in Christ to do so. Those things are permitted for Christians, but they're not required. And if we do them, they don't add a single thing to our righteousness in God's eyes. Our righteousness is based on our faith in Jesus, not the rituals we perform. That brings us to the topic I want to talk about today. So let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of the law of Moses for those who follow Jesus? Our Hebrew roots friends profess a faith in Jesus, but also want to keep the Old Testament law. Does it make sense to try to hold on to both, the gospel and the law? Don't, don't get me wrong, the Torah is a beautiful and fundamental part of the Christian faith. It's the first five books in the Christian Bible, and it's not to be done away with or tossed out. What I'm talking about is the proper orientation for a Bible-believing follower of Jesus. Does it make sense to follow Jesus and Moses, to pursue both grace and works of the law? Well, the short answer is no. I don't think that makes sense at all. In fact, it dilutes our devotion to Jesus and makes us double-minded in our pursuit of God. Let me give you four and a half reasons why trying to follow both is unbiblical and dangerous. The law of Moses requires continual blood sacrifices to atone for sin. They happen on a high holiday called the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. You can read all about it in Leviticus 16. Every single year, year after year, the high priest would perform the rituals given in Leviticus 16 in order to atone for the sins of the people of Israel. And if the law of Moses is still in effect today, well then those annual sacrifices are still required. In fact, there are some Hebrew Roots followers who believe that the temple will be rebuilt one day and those blood sacrifices for sin will, redo, will, will resume then. But if that's the case, 
If those annual sin sacrifices were, were intended to last for eternity, why did Jesus come and shed his blood on the cross? If the Torah's sin sacrifices were, were to continue on even after the sacrifice of Jesus, then his blood was ineffective and unnecessary. In fact, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 10 that those repeated animal sacrifices given in the Torah were only given as a reminder of our sins. They were not the way to ultimately atone for them. Hebrews 10.4 says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And it goes on to teach that Jesus was our sacrifice once for all, and therefore there is no longer any offering for sin. Guys, these are mutually exclusive methods of atonement. If animal sacrifices are still required every year, then the sacrifice of Jesus accomplished nothing. On the other hand, if Yeshua's sacrifice really was once for all, as the Bible says, then the animal sacrifices commanded in the Torah have served their God-ordained purpose and are no longer required. We can't follow both. Scripture doesn't leave us that option. While the prophets spoke to the people on behalf of God, the priesthood spoke to God on behalf of the people. And in the Torah, the role of the priesthood was to facilitate the offerings and sacrifices and other temple services involved in the worship of Yahweh. And the Torah explicitly commands that every priest must be an Israelite from the tribe of Levi. That's why it's called the Levitical priesthood. So if the law of Moses is still in effect today, then this priesthood is still required. But if that's the case, if the Levitical priesthood was intended to last for eternity, then why does the New Testament tell us that every believer in Jesus, whether or not they're an Israelite, is a priest and has been given priestly duties? The Apostle Peter says that all followers of Jesus are a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's priestly language. And the, in the book of Revelation, three times says that Jesus has made us priests of God. And if the law of Moses is still in effect today, how could the apostle Paul, who was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, not Levi, say that God gave him the grace to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This is more priesthood language, and it's being applied to the gospel. Romans 12.1 famously says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The priestly duties of making sacrifices acceptable to God are now the domain of every believer in Jesus, whether Jew or Gentile or Levite. And that's not all. The book of Hebrews explicitly tells us that Jesus is now our high priest, even though he descended from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi, which the law of Moses required. Hebrews 6.20 tells us that Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having, becoming, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus is now our high priest, and he will be forever, and his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, who was a priest to Abraham hundreds of years before the law of Moses was, was ever established. And remember, the law of Moses required that all priests come from the tribe of Levi. And the first Levitical high priest, of course, was Aaron, the brother of, of Moses. So Hebrews goes on to say, verse 11, now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, talking about Jesus, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? In other words, if the Levitical priesthood was God's final plan, then why did he raise up a high priest who's not part of that Levitical priesthood that began with Aaron? And then the author says this, for when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. 
For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. Jesus is not only in the order of Melchizedek, he's also from the tribe of Judah, not Levi. So there's been a change in the priesthood. And verse 12 says, when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Guys, these are mutually exclusive priesthoods. If the Levitical priesthood established in the Torah is still required today, then we have to throw out all the passages in the New Testament that say that we believers are priests and that Jesus is our high priest because those passages are expressly violating the Mosaic law if it's still in effect. On the other hand, if Jesus really has made us priests of God, able, able to perform priestly duties, and if Jesus really is our high priest, then the Levitical priesthood established in the Torah has served its God-ordained purpose and is no longer required. We can't follow both. Scripture doesn't leave us that option. I'm always amazed by God's commands for His tabernacle in the Torah. They are so full of beauty and richness and color and symbolism. And the whole concept behind the creation of a sacred sanctuary is that it served as the place where the presence of Yahweh dwelled among His people. In Exodus 25, he says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. And there are a dozen chapters in Exodus dedicated to describing the tabernacle and God's instructions for the table for bread and the golden lampstand and, and the bronze altar and the outer court and so on. And what's interesting is that God required a sanctuary, which in the Torah was a portable tabernacle for the, the nomadic Israelites. But about 400 years later, Solomon built a, a temple in Jerusalem, which then became the permanent sanctuary for the Israelites. So if the law of Moses is still in effect today, then God requires a temple today. And yet the temple was destroyed almost 2000 years ago, just as Jesus prophesied numerous times during his earthly ministry. So one question that brings up is, why would God require a sanctuary of his people and then let it be destroyed for 2,000 years and counting, leaving us with literally no way to obey all his temple commands. More importantly though, and more directly, if the temple was intended to last for eternity, then why does the New Testament tell us that believers in Jesus are now God's temple? 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. The whole idea behind the tabernacle is a sacred space where the Spirit of Yahweh can dwell among his people. And the New Testament plainly teaches that the Spirit of God dwells in us, in, in believers in Jesus. We are now the temple. And if we flip to the very back of the Bible, the, the end of the story, in the new Jerusalem to come, we're told that there will be no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Maybe this is why Jesus allowed the destruction of, of the physical temple in Jerusalem just a few years after his resurrection. In fact, he not only predicted that the temple would be destroyed, he told the Samaritan woman, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will we worship the Father. Instead, he says, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Jesus expressly told us that God's people would no longer worship him in Jerusalem at the temple. They would instead worship him in spirit and in truth. There are no longer any geographical restrictions. And he added, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Guys, these are mutually exclusive sanctuaries. If the physical tabernacle established in the Torah is still required today, then we have to throw out all of the passages in the New Testament that teach that Christians are now God's temple. On the other hand, if we accept the New Testament's teaching that we are God's temple, 
then the elaborate tabernacle commanded in the Torah has served its God-ordained purpose and is no longer needed. We can't have both sanctuaries. Scripture doesn't leave us that option. As part and parcel of the temple commands which we just looked at, God provides Israel with some very specific instructions about the innermost chamber of the tabernacle in Exodus 26. So God designed the tabernacle with a sort of, of progressive sense of holiness, right? So the outer court was where all the Israelites would, would go to make their offerings and sacrifices and do their ritual cleansing. And inside the outer court was the tabernacle itself, which was called the holy place, which only priests could enter. And then inside the holy place was a smaller room called the most holy place, where, where out of all the human beings on the planet, only one person, the high priest of the Israelites, could enter. And he could only go in once a year on Yom Kippur. And God instructed the Israelites to create a beautiful veil and hang it between the holy place and the most holy place. The Torah says this, And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. <laughs> How beautiful and elaborate. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. So they were to bring the sacred ark that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai inside this most holy room. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. So there was a very clear restriction of access to holiness in Israel. Only the high priest was allowed to enter the most holy place. None of the other Israelites could do so, not even priests. In fact, there's a famous story about when the Roman general Pompey conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC, and he walked right into the most holy place of the temple to see what it was all about. And of course, he was a pagan who was used to the worship of the gods through idols and images, and he walked into the most holy place and confirmed to his amazement that it was empty. There were no images of the God of the Israelites. And by going in there, of course, he defiled the temple, which spelled the end of, of Jewish independence, and, and then Judah became a client kingdom of, of the Roman Empire, but I digress. By the time of Jesus, the, the, clump, the temple had been rededicated, of course. And that brings us to our fourth reason why we can't hold on to both the gospel of Jesus and the law of Moses. As we just saw, the Torah required a veil inside the temple to restrict access to the most holy place. In what could be argued was God's first act under the new covenant, God himself split that veil in two. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. And don't miss the fact that that, that veil was torn from top to bottom, from God down to earth, symbolizing that access to God's presence was no longer restricted to the, to the temple in its sacred space we can now access the presence of God directly through what the author of Hebrew calls the new and living way that Jesus opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Guys, these are mutually exclusive avenues of access to God's presence. In the Torah, God commanded a veil to separate the most holy place, and then at the death of Jesus, he tore that veil down. Why? because it had served its God-ordained purpose and was no longer required. So resurrecting the law of Moses would be like trying to sew the veil back together that God tore apart. We can't have both. God didn't leave us that option. Reason number four and a half, which I guess is technically a fifth reason, but it's a subset of the first four reasons we looked at, which all had to do with the larger system of worship established in the Torah. 
And this last reason has to do with the Torah's command about circumcision. Now, the rite of circumcision is actually introduced twice in the Torah. First with Abraham in Genesis 17, and then again when we get to Moses where it's given additional significance in, in Leviticus 12. For a person to be circumcised under the law of Moses, it included a commitment to the Sinai covenant and an obligation to keep the Mosaic law. So circumcision meant a lot more under Moses than, than it originally did back in the days of Abraham. Now, here's where things get interesting in terms of the law. Now remember, in the early days of the Christian church, the Judaizers were teaching circumcision pretty strongly. It was a prominent identity marker for followers of the God of Israel. This is why in Galatians 2, Paul recounts how he had brought Titus, an uncircumcised Greek believer in Jesus, with him to Jerusalem to, to meet the apostles. And the apostles didn't require Titus to be circumcised. And yet, circumcision was required of all Israelite males under the Mosaic law. So Paul's admonition about circumcision in Galatians 5 reveals that things had changed dramatically under the new covenant. He writes this, verse 1, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. Now, circumcision was a requirement under Moses, and here Paul calls it a yoke of slavery that undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. And he says in verse 3, every man who accepts circumcision is obligated to keep the whole law. And he doesn't say that in a positive sense. Paul has just spent the first four chapters of Galatians laboring the point that the law is not how we're made right with God. He compares the law to slavery and imprisonment, and yet, for the Judaizers at the time, and for our Hebrew roots friends today, keeping the whole law is what they aspire to. But Paul is speaking of it in negative terms. He says, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. The acceptance of the Mosaic rite of circumcision as a matter of, of obedience or righteousness is an insult to the work of Christ. In fact, in the next verse, verse 4, he uses a little wordplay on the idea of circumcision and adds, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. So he's specifically talking about circumcision when it's undertaken in a ritual sense out of obedience to the law of Moses. And to drive his point home, Paul writes a few verses later, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. And then once more in chapter 6, for good measure, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Guys, these are mutually exclusive positions. In the Torah, Ritual circumcision was a command of Yahweh to be undertaken on the eighth day after birth. In the New Testament, because of the work of Christ on the cross, ritual circumcision is a yoke of slavery that undermines the value of what Jesus did for us. Circumcision has served its God-ordained purpose and is no longer required. We can't live under both positions. God didn't leave us that option. Scripture simply doesn't leave us the option of holding on to both the gospel and the law, or, or both Jesus and Moses. And this tension is the reason that as people start to pursue this theology of Torahism, they will inevitably find themselves moving past the, the initial phases of fascination and stimulation right into complication. The, the old and the new cannot be reconciled or, or held at the same time. We just saw four and a half reasons why trying to follow both is unbiblical. The Bible teaches that the old points us to the new. Moses knew this, and he prophesied to the Israelites that one day Jesus would come. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. The Lord said to me, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. 
Moses pointed to Jesus. And Jesus taught that the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms all pointed to him, right? The Hebrew Bible is crucial and foundational to our understanding of who Jesus is. So it can't be dismissed or, or done away with. We have to listen to what it tells us. And what it points us to is Jesus. I believe this is what Jesus was referring to in his parable of the wineskins when he said, Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. The old and new covenants are both parts of God's sovereign plan. They each have a vital role to play, but they are two separate covenants, and they can't both be in effect at the same time. There are just too many mutually exclusive commands, as we've just seen. Jesus did not come to point us backward to Moses. No, Moses came and the law was given to point us forward to Jesus. Galatians 3 says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now that Jesus and his new covenant have arrived, we are no longer under Moses and the old covenant. Thanks for watching. Shalom.